Right. Okay, great. I think we can we'll start. Um, okay, so uh, welcome everyone to this event that is called Communication in Human AI Interaction. Uh, so my name is Mohamed Chetwani. I'm part of the uh, Human AI. Uh, I just want to uh, let you know that uh, you heard that uh, this event is recorded. Uh, so in any, so you 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 be aware of that. Uh, but uh, we uh, we will describe a bit about uh, the organization uh, right after. Um, but uh, here, uh, so the 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 program is. Uh, uh, you have already the program. So here it's the, uh, the, the web page of the event. Uh, so we decided we are uh, part of uh, the human AI uh, and we decided to have an event that is related to communication between partners in activity in, uh, uh, and uh, really about uh, communication and human and AI interaction. So this is uh, uh, organized by uh, Jennifer uh, Renaud. Uh, you received several emails from her, uh, but also Jasmine uh, and uh, Antti. Uh, so, um, uh, to, uh, so this is part. So the, uh, the the program that we have today is uh, we will have uh, several speakers, and uh, so the, the the talks are quite short. Uh, so we will have a talk from uh, Florian Kuneman, uh, Jennifer, uh, Yasmin, uh, Ivan Rogers, and Delphine Potvin, and then we will have a, a part of a discussion at the end. So what we propose you is that uh, for you have a, so this is a, sem a web seminar, so you can uh, have a QA, so you can ask questions directly uh, on, uh, on the case. So the, the moderator and team will take also the questions and all the questions uh, will be discussed at the end. So after all the talks. So uh, I will uh, I take also the opportunity to, that we have the website is that uh, human AI. So it's a European network of human centered uh, artificial intelligence. So it's a network. So uh, we don't have too much time to describe all the stuff, but it's a network. So this means that uh, we uh, we have several labs, uh, several centers that are collaborating in uh, several uh, questions, but more uh, most of them are about human centered AI. And we are also open to a lot of uh, people, to networks, to, to, to have discussions and projects uh, with the others. And how it works is basically uh, uh, one of the main probably reasons result is uh, to have uh, this kind of uh, uh, my, micro project. So here you see uh, the link about uh, uh, how people collaborate in uh, all the projects uh, and uh, how they are uh, well connected. Uh, but what is a micro project is uh, you can have a look to the uh, several micro projects that we have. Uh, here it's a very small project about uh, ranging from three months to, 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 to six months. And they are really focused, and uh, you could have several of them, and you have a list uh, of the, the micro projects, even the, the, the results that are they providing. And what we are uh, trying to do uh, today in terms of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, activities is uh, about that. I mean, we, we, uh, we may want uh, also to have uh, in uh, communication and human interaction, we will be happy to have uh, micro projects uh, uh, that could result from uh, this kind of. Uh, uh, event. Um, so that's uh, uh, the main stuff that we uh, will uh, discuss. So don't hesitate uh, to ask uh, questions uh, uh, and to, to, to put uh, the, your questions. So we will uh, uh, monitor the questions. And as I said, the, the event is recorded for the people that are just joining now. And uh, we will have all the questions at the end. So please, uh, I hope you will enjoy the, the event. So now I give uh, the floor to uh, Florian Kuneman from the uh, University of uh, Pew Amsterdam, who will uh, speak uh, about uh, introducing SEPL, a dialogue management approach based on conversation patterns. Florian, I give you the floor. Thanks, Mohamed. Uh, yeah, very happy to participate in this uh, event. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Michel Klein uh, for the event and the initial invitation. This is joint work with uh, Koen Hendricks. Um, and I'm here to present a new dialogue management framework and uh, uh, meant to be a provocative, but it's, yeah, it's not so provocative statement at the beginning is sequence organization is key to more successful human AI, uh, human AI interaction. 
And this is uh, focused on dialogue management. And that's is essentially the task of during a dialogue for an agent to, to keep track of what the conversation is about, what the dialogue state is, and subsequently the dialogue policy. So deciding given the state of the dialogue, what to say next. And if we look in the realm of task-based dialogue management, so dialogue uh, focused on a certain task, then we see a very strong bias in academia on these kinds of tasks. So booking a flight, um, uh, getting a, a bank account set up, these kinds of things. The user has a request and we see that research mostly focuses on really get a clear conceptualization of what the user actually wants to be able to get to the best response um, uh, to accommodate the user. And also in commercial systems, we see the same kind of pattern. So uh, uh, these dialogue uh, uh, interfaces through which uh, a Google Home or an Amazon Alexa can be uh, 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 set up, an assistant in those contexts, it's mostly focused on, on conversations where a user has a request, the user initiates it, and the agent has to help the user as best as possible. And that's basically the end of the conversation uh, in the task-based uh, dialogue. And, and, and this, this is what we then see. So very structured conversations, uh, maintainable length, so say five to 15 terms max, and there's close domain knowledge involved. But if you wanna move forward, uh, say to more semi-structured or unstructured conversations with a more extended length, and, and the need of general knowledge, generic knowledge, then we really need to look into the sequence organization that, what, that I will tell about more uh, uh, in an additional slide. But first, to say something about this semi-structured uh, uh, domain that I'm talking about, think about a cooking assistant that assists the user in uh, cooking a recipe. So there's structure. You have a cooking recipes with different recipe steps. Uh, but there's also uh, uh, less structure because the user should have the chance to, uh, uh, at every stage in the recipe, ask the, uh, the agent for questions and the agent should be able to accommodate this. So this is what that may look like at the start of such a conversation. They need to, of course, uh, uh, get a clear understanding of what recipe to cook, then all the recipes and utensils should be at place and then the different steps will be explained. So there is structure, but there is also uh, room for deviation from the structure. And there's really uh, a need for generic knowledge in the cooking domain. So any question about a, an ingredient that may or may not be replaced by another ingredient and the like uh, that's needed. But in this talk, I will focus on maintaining a coherent uh, conversation across all these terms. And uh, for this, we really need to turn towards the field of conversation analysis. So what we see there, uh, it, uh, there, there is a clear structure uh, in the way that people sequentially organize their, co their conversations. So if I greet, then the expectation that the agree will be uh, uh, done by the other person as well. And that's an adjacency pair. And it's strictly speaking an expectation. Also, when I ask a question, the, uh, the outcome is not always an answer from the other person. So uh, that's what you see in the right-hand example. Uh, a question is being asked in the fifth turn, and then a question in return is being asked that is related to this question, but it's not a direct answer. It's a question to collect more information. In turn seven, again, a question is being asked, and only in turn 10, the initial question that has been asked in, in turn five uh, is being definitively addressed. So there's sequence expansion here, as we call it, and, and this is a typical way of sequentially organizing. There is structure, there, there, there is an interlinkage between all these terms. Uh, and if you look inside the into the dialogue management as we see it right now, this is not really an inherent part of it. They don't have a conceptualization of, okay, now we are expanding on it, but we need to get back to this term five at some point. And that's what we want to be focusing on. And if we look at the conversational UX design, so that's handcrafted dialogue management, there's definitely a, a recognition of the importance of this. So Moore has uh, proposed this, working with dialogue patterns, so sequences of these terms. Uh, but it's strictly speaking, it's handcrafting. So if you want to make a cooking assistant, it will be a lot of work to handcraft all these different sequence expansions and these different patterns. So what we propose, and, and this is the problem statement, to, to make it an inherent part of the dialogue policy. And that should help eventually to scale up our assistance uh, and to enable them to uh, uh, conduct longer coherent interactions. 
I will not go into the technical details here, but just for your understanding, the core of what we propose is this pattern knowledge base. So basically a knowledge base with all the different sequences that are common to a conversation. And secondly, we have this set of uh, uh, rules based on the paradigm of the information state update by which these patterns are linked. I will now in the remainder of this uh, short time span show uh, what this may look like in an example in the cooking domain. So here we have an example conversation where the agent starts greeting the user. User doesn't greet back, but responds directly with what recipes can you instruct? Uh, agent wants to know more about that. Do you fancy any particular cuisine? Uh, user responds with Italian food. There's a recommendation here, but the user doesn't choose the recipe yet, wants, wants to have some more information. Again, the, the agent asks a question. So there's quite some sequence expansion going on here. And, and here's what it will look like given our dialogue management framework. So it is uh, visualized as a tree here where you start at the root and the agent draws upon what we call its agenda. So there's this pattern of greeting to start with. Uh, and that's what the agent does here, agenda-based selection. That's a rule in our dialogue management. Well, what follows as, uh, as I've shown in the example, the user doesn't greet back. So uh, that's what we call an interruption. And note, all our patterns come with a certain expectation. So the agent starts here and the expectation is that the user greets. But what we see is the user doesn't choose to greet back, but chooses to directly inquire into the options. So that's for the agent to signal that a new pattern has started and it shouldn't expect any greet at a later point in the conversation. So moving on, um, in the uh, next turn, the, the agent doesn't directly continue with the pattern to give advice, but it wants to have some more information, which is seen as a slot filling uh, and sequence expansion uh, uh, pattern. And there uh, the user uh, addresses this question, do you fancy any particular uh, cuisine? And note in the tree that we are going uh, down a couple of levels with the expectations that we need to get back on a higher track at some point. Um, here's another manifestation where the, the, uh, the, the current pattern is closed and then the agent draws upon the, uh, the former pattern that they were in and then giving an advice and so on. Um, so looking at the time, uh, okay, there's a little bit of time. So, so this is the, uh, the general idea here, uh, um, our dialogue management approach. And there are still some steps that need to be taken. The, the, the rules are made, probably not complete. We really need to collect more data. But the general notion that I want to bring across here is that these patterns are an inherent part of how the agent looks at how the conversation is conducted and, and, and how the patterns should be combined. So getting back to the start uh, of the presentation, this, uh, uh, this statement sequence organization is key to more powerful human AI interaction. Uh, I hope to have shown that um, this knowledge inside the agent of these common conversation patterns, and they can be really generic, like greeting, which is applicable to any conversation domain, but they can also be domain specific, such as in the cooking domain. Uh, that's a very important thing to incorporate, uh, as well as the way in which they are interlinked. The, the, the notion of, for example, sequence expansion, but I can also imagine that conversation repair can be really part of these rules. And this is a powerful and natural way for agents to, co to coordinate extended conversations along with the user. And that's really where we need to be going uh, in the future, in our view. Uh, thanks for your attention. We have this place on uh, uh, at, um, uh, socialrobotics.atlassian.net where we uh, uh, try to maintain information about this project and we have our personal web pages. Thanks. Thanks for, for the talk. Um, as we said, uh, you can already ask uh, all the questions on the QA and uh, we will take all the questions at the end. So now I give the floor to Jennifer uh, from uh, University of Erebro. Yes, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to see this event happening and to be here. Um, I would like on my side to talk from a multi-agent system perspective and more specifically see what might happen when we are actually trying to put a human in our multi-agent systems. 
And what I'm actually trying, going to try to convince you about is that human-human communication should actually not be the gold standard of communication. So let's see if I manage to do that. First, a little bit of context to, for you to understand where I'm talking from. Um, I'm a researcher in communication planning for human AI cooperation. So which means that my main research question is how can we plan communication acts in order to enhance not only the team performance, but also the human's comfort and trust toward the AI agent. And in this talk, I'm talking about communication as the creation of meaning between partners. So I'm taking a very broad definition, which contains most, uh, not only the contents, the message exchanges, the type of pitch acts we're considering, but also the modality of communication, um, whether it's natural language, iconography, gestures, and also social cues and nonverbal communication. As part of my research, I'm mostly focusing on the content from, uh, from now on, but in this talk, I'm talk talking about all of those, basically. And I'm using uh, personal communication as a tool for cooperation. Now, that being said, um, when we talk about multi-agent planning and multi-agent system, we tend to see two extreme positions. On one hand, we have a pure AI AI communication, which is currently completely dominated by multi agent reinforcement learning algorithm. So the thing is, the agents are learning to communicate with each other. Um, often they are also learning the actual structure of the message, as well as the content that they wish to exchange. As a result, it makes it extremely difficult to introduce a human in the loop, as humans cannot always make sense of the messages that are being exchanged. That being said, there have been some applications that allow for very structured communication, and especially in game uh, developments, maybe you've heard about the Anadi benchmark, for instance, in which the messages are predetermined. And recent research tends to suggest that even in these cases, the humans are not enjoying so much the interaction, and they can't really make sense of what the agent is actually communicating. So even though they understand the message because the structure is fixed they don't understand the intent behind the message and the message does not make sense in this context now on the other side of the spectrum we have what i called here the agnostic agent view which is a bit the more classic approach of multi-agent system so in this agnostic view the agent is, is neither a human nor a robot nor an ai it could theoretically be both and the communication is designed by defining protocols pitch acts intentions which are easily manipulatable by a, by a human. And for this reason, a human could theoretically replace any agent in the system easily. This type of agnostic agents means that they are trying to reach, to copy human-like communication as close as possible. Because if we want to be able to put a human anywhere in our system, then it needs to be understandable and human-like. And in the middle here, um, there starts to be quite a bunch of recent research that focuses on the fact that multi-agent system might be both made of human and AI. And you can find this under the terms mixed multi-agent system, human machine team, human agent team, human robot interactions. Um, and this bunch of research considers and acknowledge the existence of two different entity in the human and the AI agent and crafts messages and communication algorithms that target the message for the human. The thing is they are so far very often application dependent they are very little amount of um, generic approaches for this and actually they also usually aim at getting as close as possible to the agnostic view and meaning a perfect human-like communication and we can see that in this branch of research we justify usually our algorithms or protocol choices by saying that's how humans do being guilty of that myself um, as well as the mistakes and quirks produced by those systems by saying, no, but they are, they, they are mistakes in human communication too. So it's actually, it can be okay. We just need to recover from that. Now, in my opinion, the problem with this agnostic view and very human-like communication, there are three problems, basically. Um, the first one being that an agnostic view tends to erase the differences between the human and machine. So I think we will all agree that human and machines have different sensing and reasoning ability. Um, and an agnostic view erases those differences and their generic roles and risk limiting possibilities. So this does not account for the fact that 
my computer is much better than me to analyze time series or extract patterns from, from humongous amount of data, uh, but I'm much better than it at recognizing sarcasm or summarizing a complex situation for now, my exchange. Um, the second problem is erasing expectation. So until AI systems are indistinguishable from humans with all the ethical questions that we raise, there will be expectations when humans are interacting with AI systems. There will be differences in interactions, preferences in the AI role, and not considering these expectations might lead to suboptimal collaboration. And finally, the problem of control is that if humans are to stay in control of the interaction, and I personally believe that they should, we cannot adopt an agnostic view because we need to know the nature of each partner. The, the interaction, the communication between the human and the AI is by default um, not symmetrical. One needs to stay in control of the interaction while the other one is more following uh, the interaction. So we need, in my opinion, to redefine human AI communication for multi-agent planning. And I took the following quote from a recent research uh, paper published by Andrea Guzman and colleagues. Um, borrowing from human communication to inform human machine communication, HMC, comes with risk. Should human communication be the gold standard against which HMC is judged? And they borrow from Spence and colleagues saying that starting from the position that human machine communication is inherently lesser would actually restrict the scope of future research. And when we think about it, there are examples in other areas in which nature inspire our way to approach a problem, but we got away from simply copying it. Our planes don't flap their wings to fly. It might have started that way. The wing design has been inspired by birds, design, uh, birds wings design, but the bird's way of flying is not considered gold standard for human to do so. It has inspired aeronautical engineers, but they got away from it. And I believe we should do the same or similar for human AI communication. We should be focusing on this and human AI communication as its own topic of research. So far, we base our communication protocols and theories on models and theories that have been developed for human-human communication. And why I agree that a model of how human communicates is extremely important to create a good human AI communication theory, I also strongly believe that we should study how human communicates with machines in general and AI in particular, because we might find some very specifics in this type of communication that we must leverage to benefit the human partner. In my opinion, we should strive to empower the humans through communication with AI and not copy them. And to finish, I would like to leave you with those three little, not so small take home messages. Um, the first one being that human human communication can help us understand humans communication patterns and guide us, but should not always be an ideal to turn towards. The second one is that human communication is a related but distinct research topic that it is necessary to address to create more efficient, reliable, and trustworthy human machine teams. And finally, that human AI communication contains a wide range of questions, both technical, psychological, philosophical, societal, and more, and is inherently a multidisciplinary field. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thanks, Anita. Uh, now we move to the next talk from uh, Yasmin. Uh, also, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, I will share my screen now. Yes, here it is. Good. Uh, so, uh, hello, everybody. I'm uh, also from Örebro University, like uh, Jenny and Ian from the same department. So, um, and my topic uh, is proactive human machine communication and interaction. And my provocative claim uh, for, uh, uh, for, for this talk is um, human machine interaction and communication, uh, when it is to be effective, then it needs to be proactive. So, um, what does proactivity actually mean? Uh, there is not one on, only one single uh, definition that is accepted by everybody, but uh, how I would define it is the following. 
it's uh, being able to act uh, and communicate on own uh, initiative. Uh, and that means that there is nobody external that needs to give the agent the goal. But the agent can generate uh, the goal itself and can decide when to pursue and uh, to pursue it. And it's doing so by using uh, anticipation uh, into the future. And then the question, why would we actually want to have uh, an agent that uh, an artificial agent that is proactive? Uh, well, uh, the short answer is, is um, if you want to have uh, the, the robot, the artificial agent as a co-worker to the human in a, in a shared environment with a the human, then it's just, uh, it's just more natural. It's what the, the human would expect from any other new human co-worker or co-inhabitant or just co-human, so to say. And just to make this a little bit more illustrative, I have here the story of uh, Mr. Slow-Witted and Mrs. Heavy-Handed. So imagine these two are your new colleagues um, and they are really knowledgeable and skilled in their uh, special field. So uh, that's, that's great, but then they have several issues uh, when you want to work together with them because uh, they don't do things by themselves on own initiative, but you need to tell them each and every single step when to do, what to do, uh, and they don't take a very wide, um, time frame into account either and uh, and also they don't uh, take um, the perspective of other people and, and so um, uh, can happen that they would impose the, the will on, on somebody else and when you think about it uh, this would be really difficult to work together with colleagues like that so let's look at uh, a use case, for example, when we have a robot that uh, is able to communicate uh, proactively with uh, the user that is working with. This is a use case uh, taken from a work together within a human AI micro project and my co co-workers, collaborators are here today and they will recognize it. Uh, let's imagine you have the human that wants to go on a hike. Uh, this is the intention of the user, of the user, and the robot is able to reason on this intention of the of the human. Uh, it understands. Uh -huh, well, uh, I recognize uh, the human will go uh, is planning to go on a hike. So then there are different acting alternatives or communication alternatives that the robot could choose from. Um, for example, one alternative would be to remind the user to bring a water bottle with, uh, with uh, her to, to the hike, because otherwise she might get dehydrated. So that's one option, uh, and that is uh, inferred by reasoning on the intention of the user going for a hike. But then we said proactivity has also to do with reasoning on uh, what is the what is what is the state now, but also anticipating how the state will evolve, evolve in the future. And if the robot does that, then it sees now the weather is fine, it's sunny, uh, everything is good, but in the future there will be hail coming and the user being out and hiking uh, and the hail uh, going on, that's not a really very desirable state we want the user to be in. Uh, and so, uh, instead of uh, taking the acting alternative or the communication alternative of reminding the user of taking along, bringing along the water bottle, the robot chooses instead to go to the user on own initiative and proactively warn the user to go on a hike because there will be hail. Uh, let's look at a different um, uh, use case, and this comes from industry, and it's it's a, a real use case, and I just learned about it in effect uh, last week. It comes from uh, Volvo GTO, uh, and, uh, and it works uh, uh, as follows. Imagine you have a factory and a robot arm that you can see here is, um, is lifting a heavy item together with a human. And the goal is, uh, well, they, they want to place it into this workbench here on the left to be further processed. And the, the robot arm can lift most of the weight and the human should guide where exactly and how to place uh, uh, this heavy item. And now uh, imagine uh, that, you, that you have uh, a, a robot arm that is proactive or can communicate proactively. 
it can uh, recognize the intentions of the human and see that uh, how the human is about to place the, the object uh, is putting the human into a, a dangerous situation. Uh, and so it can proactively choose to communicate to the user, uh, don't do this, you have to choose a different solution because this will bring you into danger. But maybe in factory, you know, it could be very loud and, and it does not work to just uh, say, uh, say it verbally, uh, this warning. Uh, so the, the robot also has to reason about that. It has to, to choose the right modality, uh, given the context. So the right modality maybe in the loud factory environment would be either visual or maybe even tactile. It could show the user, uh, this is not the right way to place the item. Okay, so now that we've seen all those uh, use cases, uh, if we want to extract from them what, uh, what, what is necessary, what are the cognitive capabilities that are necessary to, to act proactively and to communicate proactively? Uh, well, one uh, ingredient, so to say, is uh, what, are, what you, would, you, we could, you could call epistemic reasoning, and that is uh, you remember the reason the robot could reason about the, 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 the knowledge of the user, what does the user know or the human, and, and, and the intentions and so on. The agent, the proactive agent, has to be uh, aware of the, of the current context, uh, what is the current state. The proactive agent has to be able to do prediction. It, can, it, it should anticipate how the, how the future environment will evolve, but also how the future state of the human will be. It has to be able to do planning, obviously, if you want to, uh, if you have to commute, compute different acting alternatives, uh, hypothetically, uh, and see what the effects are in order to make a, a sound decision of which uh, activity you proactively want to enact in the in the end. And then when you have chosen this activity, then you have to plan for it. It has to be able to reason on preferences, um, uh, the human's preferences, but maybe even common preferences. Uh, general preferences. It uh, it uh, can, must be reason, uh, must be able to reason on preferences that are uh, uncertain, dynamic. They change all the time, and it must be aware of that it's itself uncertain about these preferences. It has to do. Uh, it has to be able to to make decisions uh, which activity should be enacted and when. It has to reason about uncertainty in many different aspects in the state. In the, in the epistemic con concepts, in the preferences, and so on. And finally, uh, multimodality, you also have to take this into account, uh, which way of communication should be chosen in which context. Here is a number of uh, works that have been done so far uh, within proactive uh, communication and interaction between human and, uh, and agent but I don't have time to go through them all. Um, and I want to finish with, um, uh, with, the, with some, it's not all, uh, some challenges and directions of where to go here. Um, often when uh, people or even the research as it is now, it's call it, calling itself proactive, but very often it's not what I would call proactive because uh, very often they you just have like one rule that says one trigger and then do this action and it's always the case so that that, that does not scale because then you have to write uh, an un endless amount of rules uh, so that's not working it must be a more flexible approach uh, it would be nice to have a general approach that is domain independent so uh, so you could use it uh, anywhere or in at least a, a number of domains then very often also the current uh, proactivity work uh, could be focused on just or, or showing within a toy problem. It would be nice, of course, to have it in real world scenarios. And then also, uh, I think, uh, maybe not just to focus on one certain aspect of proactivity, but taking uh, all uh, these ingredients that are listed here into account. Yes, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, thanks. Uh, we move now to the talk of uh, Ivan Lucien.
Um, hi there. Uh, let me just get my yes. Let me see. Thanks. Okay. Uh, this was a bit of AI in PowerPoint that recommended this to be my first slide, so it's not me doing the animation. Um, I just want to start off by saying uh, my micro project at the beginning of the year was with uh, Michelle Klein and Kern Hendricks, where we looked at micro conversations with a chatbot to encourage people to be less sedentary, to get up and exercise. But my talk today is going to be more general on some of the other projects about how do we design these micro conversations. So my claim is that uh, AI chatbot agents, as we've heard in the earlier talks, are becoming a quite a versatile mode of user interaction. But from my perspective, which is H human computer interaction, we can help to design them to be even better and perhaps much more, much better. Oh. There we go. So we've seen how chatbots are, that have been designed commercially and in research are now everywhere. Customer services, banks, marketing, sales, government sites to get information, travel sites, virtual friends and increasingly mental health apps. And um, the early ones were largely rule based, uh, tree branched, which made them quite uh, brittle in some regards. And, and now we're seeing uh, more of them are becoming AI based using natural language processing and IBM Watson, and this is making them more versatile. But I think that perhaps there is a hybrid, which is something in between. Uh, this one here was uh, on the right is uh, one for travel and it, as you can see, it understands the context um, and uh, takes into account um, uh, what's been said before. This is an example, though, there are still lots of really bad ones out there. Last week, I tried to get hold of British Gas, which uh, provide gas uh, because I've just changed uh, utility. And it was their chatbot. And I said, um, I've been trying to get on the website to uh, see what my account is. And it's got technical difficulties. So I couldn't phone anyone up. And I just said, I'm a new customer. It's been out of action for over a week. Tried logging on several times now, no joy. And the chatbot said, uh, you're through to me at the complaints. I, I didn't really want to make a complaint, but never mind. And they said, uh, stop response, I'm sorry. Uh, and then asked if I wanted to confirm if I wanted to make a formal complaint. And I said, no. Uh, um, and then they left. And then I waited, British Gas came back and said, you're 25th in the queue. 14th in the queue and so on it was really uh, and eventually I got to speak to, I didn't get to speak I got to text to a human being but it was a really bad design let's just stop there and it could be much better and I think they are getting better some have put more effort into thinking about uh, the user and the context and they'll learn typical questions that users will ask and then match their responses and if therefore set types of uh, queries or questions like card payments, um, then uh, they can be designed better. Also, you know, knowing when to flag uh, the, the interaction so that it can switch to human customer service agents and much more quickly than I had, I think is quite an important aspect of the design. But I'm interested in how we can enhance the user experience. Uh, and this one on the right is Clio Bank Assistance, and it's been designed to be more friendly or chummy. And as you can see here, it talks in you know, everyday language, yep, it adds emojis, and it appears chatty, uh, almost like it could be arguably like a human being. The user experience, I think, can uh, be designed to be even more human-like, whether you think that's a good idea or not. Um, I think uh, the, the talk after mine will be uh, uh, talking about this as well. But this is Replica. If you haven't tried Replica, I, I recommend you have a go. It's a companion avatar that moves, uh, uh, the avatar moves uh, and the eyes move. And then you have this conversation uh, with it in the chat as if it's like a text. So that's probably the most human-like of, of all of the chatbots. 
Um, but I want to talk a bit about the work that we've been doing, which follows on from uh, the previous talk, which is uh, how do you make proactive chatbots? And I think there is a role for them, particularly when they're embedded in other tasks. And the task that we've been interested in uh, is you know, using chatbots to encourage uh, sense making when you're in a team. How can you encourage people in a team to, to talk more and to, to try and work things out? So we've designed a, a chatbot called Vizzy. And it, the proactiveness is to prompt uh, teams at opportune times. We do have two or three simple rules when they decide that when that might be. And then it's to get them to think along a particular direction. So some of the example probing questions are, if, I'd, if I would say one of them is slowing down in recent years, which one would you say it is? So if you look to the right, this is uh, data visualizations for obesity levels uh, for, for different variables uh, over time. And they need to think about why is it that one's going higher than the other? What's causing this trend? And you can, you know, so they're trying to work things out. So other questions are quite open-ended. What might have caused the sudden spike? And what we found in our research, which is about to be published in Tokai, is that the approach, this approach of thinking about embedding uh, proactive agents uh, to, uh, can trigger more discussion, more ideation and brainstorming. I don't have time to go through the study here, but um, if you're interested, uh, we have the paper on that. So there is Vizzy uh, through the smart speaker embedded in a data analytics software tool we've developed. Another one that we've developed is called GoFish. And this was designed um, as a chatbot to help users learn how to detect and avoid um, clicking on phishing emails. And you've all been uh, scammed or almost scammed. So the way in which it works is it's um, again embedded into an email uh, uh, um, uh, thing here. And it will pick up, the system will pick up that there's possibly an un, you know, a phishing email there. Let me just play the video. And uh, so the user can click on that chat bot and it will come up. And uh, what we've done is designed the, the, the interaction to have a mix of uh, being able to select from options here. So it doesn't have to be like a human conversation. It makes it, you know, and the idea here is to get the user to, to reflect uh, in a short micro conversation whether or not they think this is unusual or normal. So specific questions. And they also play, you know, think about what the user is going through. So have you previously received, oh, it's going really quickly there. Uh, and don't forget to check the URLs. It tells them what to do just before they click on it to see whether or not this is a fish. So the interactions there are about uh, five or six. And this is the idea is in the moment embedded in the task to get them to think, yes, this is um, ra uh, rather than just, you know, regretting clicking on it. Um, so that's um, an example of uh, something that we've developed this summer um, and have been testing um, as a way of helping people to just reflect in the moment, to have, if you like, this kind of internal dialogue as to when they're not certain about something. So I won't go through this because of the time, but you can see we've designed it to have options and like at scale, so uh, to get people to reflect themselves. So I want to just finish off uh, by uh, suggesting some des design principles that are human centered for, for thinking about these micro conversations. And a micro conversation is just having a small interaction. It's not meant to be a long extended conversation that you might have with an agent. So we heard uh, in the first talk um, about the use of uh, openings. So or com they're known as fatics, um, where you, they start and end a conversation um, such as greetings, like how are you, how it's going, that can be very, you know, get people at ease. Then uh, there are stock responses uh, you might want to include uh, when users ask silly questions or testing the limit, like are you really a human being, do you smell? Uh, prompts, which is uh, what we've been working on, thinking about how do you, what kinds of prompts and how do you steer and guide and scaffold uh, interactions or conversations, opportune times. And then uh, contextual triggers, uh, which is to uh, make the prompt relevant to what the user is doing at a particular stage of a problem solving task. So this was, you know, the visualizations in our Visi task. Options, which I've just shown you um, in the last uh, um, go fishing uh, one, which is to embed those to make it easy for the user to select and, and reflect in the moment. Turns uh, we've heard about in the conversation analysis. And then I think the humor is quite important to 
uh, to be used, but sparingly. So I'm just going to finish off by concluding, which is I hope I've shown you some of the ways in which uh, research and understanding uh, and methods in human centered uh, uh, HCI can be used to think about designing and creating micro conversations that importantly um, augment user activities rather than make them to be a substitute for human conversation. So I agree we shouldn't be emulating human conversation, but we should be designing these kinds of different types of micro conversations that match the task in hand. Thank you. Thank you uh, for being in time and thank you for the talk. Uh, now I keep the floor to Delfin. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. Is that okay for the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be uh, here to talk about social uh, virtual agents. So I'm uh, from the company David Humanizers. That's a French company. Uh, specialized in the conception of virtual agents. And I'm also working in collaboration with the lab Lysen in uh, Paris-Saclay University with uh, Céline Clavel and uh, Nicolas Sabouré. So my claim today is that we need intimacy in human agent interactions. So are you ready to reveal your true self? So just to start my talk, I'd like to uh, share this uh, little exchange that is coming from the website, the 10 worst chatbots ever. So this uh, type of uh, exchange uh, typically illustrates the uh, user and satisfaction and the adoption issues that uh, virtual agents are facing actually in the uh, marketplace. Uh, but the fact is that we know from the uh, HCI literature that task-related skills are essential, of course, but uh, insufficient on their own to satisfy customer and the uh, social and emotional dimension of the interaction strongly matters. So that's the reason why I was interested in this social dimension. And I particularly focused on one uh, uh, social skill that is intimacy, because it's prominent in human relationships. So intimacy in uh, human uh, interactions is an interpersonal process of emotional communication between two partners so it's really a dyadic process, uh, which will allow for honest and genuine interactions that are rooted in a positive stance of mutual understanding. So it's quite complex uh, context that involve uh, verbal communication and nonverbal communication. So why uh, intimacy is interesting for my purpose is because it's not only related to romance and it can appear in almost all types of relationships and especially in customer relationship and in a human agent relationship with where, sorry, intimacy is related to more engagement, more social presence and more um, social behaviors from users. So my question is that, why is the role, what is the role of intimacy in a human agent interaction for the adoption of virtual agents in the market? And what about the, the real wide situations of interaction? So to answer this question, uh, we've developed a virtual tourism counselor uh, that has uh, natural language processing capacities and a 3D animation engine. And our virtual counselor is able to, uh, to understand users' requests in natural language. And then she will help uh, visitors in a tourist office uh, by providing appropriate expert answers with her verbal and nonverbal communication and in real time. So we've built an experiment. Uh, we asked 60 uh, volunteers to uh, interact with our virtual counselor. So these persons were uh, real tourists. They came to the office spontaneously because they had real questions to, to raise. And so we proposed them to uh, raise them first to our virtual agents. And so it was completely free interaction. They could uh, understand anytime they wanted and ask any question they wanted. So we had to condition, uh, and in the control condition, uh, the agent were providing only task-related information, so factual tourism information 
And as you can see, she only had a really kind of neutral uh, nonverbal communication. And we also had another one agent, the intimacy agent, um, that provided exactly the same factual tourism information, but had um, verbal and nonverbal intimacy cues. As you can see here, for example, in the uh, nonverbal communication, so she is smiling, she, she is having open handed uh, gestures, uh, noting. Okay. And so, what was the aim of this uh, study? It was um, assessing the uh, intimacy perception of the uh, agent from users and assessing uh, user experience. So we collected behavioral data from the uh, dial the dialogue system logs of the uh, of the uh, agent, and we also collected perceptive data, so their virtual intimacy perception of the users and their user experience. We uh, were we were based on the uh, user experience model Q model of Malkin Turing. So this model describes in uh, user experience as a three uh, dimension. Um, concept, and uh, we get the perception of instrumental qualities of the system. We get the uh, perception of non-instrumental qualities of the system, and the third dimension is the emotional reaction. So this uh, this uh, framework is really in interesting for us because it really integrates the uh, user emotion as an integral part of the uh, uh, the user experience. And in the uh, the in the uh, ergonomics, it's only um, uh, it's maybe one or there are maybe like one or two uh, models that are integrating uh, really the emotion. But um, we were really uh, interesting in something. Uh, in this model, the authors they do not make any clear link uh, between the interaction in itself and the emotional reactions of the user, but when we based on the computer or social actors paradigm, uh, we can uh, hypothesize that um, the fact of interacting with a virtual agent that is having social abilities might be eliciting directly um, emotions to users independently on the way they perceive the qualities of the system. So we uh, suggest that this link is uh, existent. And it's one of the things that we've been tested in this experiment. So just a few information uh, about what we have uh, observed. Uh, first, uh, we observed that in average, uh, people were uh, raising 11 questions per exchange, and 18% uh, were misunderstood by the agent. Uh, fortunately, that had no impact on the uh, social perception of the users. And what we also observed is that uh, when the the participants were interacting with the the virtual agent that was social, um, they were not. This was not like they were not encouraged to uh, to uh, interact longer. So there was no difference uh, in terms of the length of the interaction. But what we observed is that we observed an increase of the users' social reactions to the agent. So they were more friendly with the agents, they were more polite, they were asking more personal information, personal questions. Uh, so they were uh, they were more social with, uh, with the virtual uh, agent that was uh, exhibiting uh, intimacy behaviors. Um, in previous studies, we uh, tested uh, the uh, verbal and nonverbal behaviors of the agent in a uh, role play um, video clips uh, of interaction. And we observed that the, the intimacy behaviors were greatly perceived by the, the external observers. So here in this study, unfortunately, we only uh, perceived uh, the, uh, like the participants only perceived the honesty and genuineness of the, uh, of the uh, agent. And we were also interested in the user experience. Uh, and among all the subdimensions of user experience that we've tested, only the perception of the social status and the engagement of the users uh, were impacted by the intimacy behaviors 
of the virtual consulate. So regarding this result, we could argue that maybe virtual intimacy is not such a good lever to create incredible human agent interactions. Uh, since uh, intimacy behaviors only have uh, a mitigated effect on users. But we also found other really interesting results. Is that when perceived, and this will be my point, intimacy behaviors in a virtual agent seem to be a strong predictor of uh, UX and emotion. And we also run multiple uh, mediation analysis. And what we found is that the perceived virtual intimacy has a direct effect on emotions. So this might suggest that the interaction it itself could have a direct effect on the emotions of the users uh, independently and um, in addition of the uh, effect that is mediated from uh, by the uh, perception of the in instrumental and non-instrumental qualities of the system. So my conclusion is that virtual intimacy may be a good lever to increase user experience and as a consequence, the adoption of virtual agents in the marketplace. Uh, three ways to uh, go further is that first, we need to improve the behavioral congruency and rendering of the behaviors of the, uh, the virtual agents. The, th the second point is that we need to work on adapted at system because social skills are dyadic process. So we need to understand the uh, user's emotional state and to react according. And third one is that we need to run to run studies with real users in wild situations. And it's exactly what we, we've seen in, in this experiment. When we test in lab, it really works well, but when we test uh, in the real life, it's much more mitigated. So it's really understand to uh, it's really important to understand uh, all the factors that are influencing real interaction with uh, chatbots and virtual agents. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Devin. Uh, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, now we move to the uh, panel discussion and I give the floor to Auntie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for exciting opening talks. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have roughly half an hour to go uh, through the questions that we've been having and posting into the chat. And uh, of course, there's way too many questions to go through all together. So I have uh, picked, uh, so maybe we can open the discussion by having one question per panelist. And I've been doing a bit of filtering and then trying to find uh, interesting themes, but also a bit uh, cross cutting. So I, I hope that then other panelists uh, would also <clears throat> um, give their remarks uh, in case they, they uh, have something to say about this. So I, I, for, for Florian, I, I picked this question that um, like, you know, it's, there's clearly a need to develop uh, the conversational abilities of these agents and, and you're touching on something really valuable when you go to look at uh, conversation analysis and uh, I, I think there was a, there was a link to ethnomethodology, turn taking and all these uh, classics. And, and I wonder uh, you know, if there's a way to learn some of those patterns uh, from, by, by interacting or, or from data. Um, is that even a, a meaningful goal? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the question. And maybe someone else asked it, but I didn't uh, see it. Uh, that's a, a, a very uh, relevant thing. So there are a couple of aims that we uh, need to uh, pursue. Well, a lot of them, but with this dialogue management framework, one of them is scalability. And if you want to scale up, then we can't have all humans uh, think of all the different patterns that might be there in conversation. Um, so definitely we need an automated way as well to have dialogue corpora as input and to find the common patterns, sequences of dialogue moves that tend to follow one another. And there is line of work uh, uh, in this respect, but it's still, it's quite challenging because you need to have a, a notion of the, uh, the dialogue moves. So that's not particularly what someone says, but what the dialogue act is. Um, so I do see a big challenge there, but that is definitely something that is needed to, to achieve this scaling up aim. How many such patterns do you think that there are? And uh, in all the 
conversations that are conducted in the in the world, I, I think there are a lot uh, and, and maybe infinite, uh, but there's definitely a long tail and a very uh, set of common patterns. And I think if we manage to 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 have this coverage, so so say the top thousand patterns in in general, and maybe focusing on a domain going for the same thing, I think you can get uh, uh, enable a whole lot of different conversations with the user. Uh, Yvonne, you have a, a comment, please. Yeah. I, I would argue that there aren't a thousand of them. I think, you know, the ones that we tend to read, are, there's about six or seven, that, and you mentioned those. And I think perhaps there's something, perhaps it's a lot less. Perhaps we could, could do with just say 20 and then think about the context and, key, you know, key words. So have a, not just try and get every single pattern there is, but maybe have a hybrid approach where you've got like 20 uh, common patterns, maybe a few outliers, and then use the context and think about how you model that so that you have this kind of, and then my suggestion was that we don't have to always have a conversational, you can have options that you can select from, which makes the design of the interface and management of it uh, much easier. So we don't have to try and emulate this, the richness of human conversation by identifying every pattern, but just the most common ones and then add um, some other aspects to designing it. Yeah. It's getting really exciting because Florian, you said that there's an infinite number uh, and long tail. And Yvonne, you said that there's maybe eight. <laughs> and then uh, Kuhn Hendricks was uh, posting to chat that there's maybe 100. Yeah, so so Kuhn's remark is, is based on this uh, conversational UX design book that we both read, and, and, and he describes the most important ones, uh, divided in a couple of categories, and indeed you get to a couple of hundreds, but I, I think Yvonne's remark is also an interesting one, and uh, yeah, true thing is that we need, uh, it, it, it's, it is an interesting line of research to see how, how specific or how general we can be. Uh, uh, because we want to enable the user to have options as well. So I think if you start with a, a smaller set like 20, then definitely a lot of conversations can be successful. Uh, my thesis at this point would be that we need to have more patterns to enable more flexibility in conversations. Okay. I, I think I think start simple and grow. So start with just... Mm -hmm. Definitely. And you know, maybe use some machine learning to see well this this response might be better in this context, and and uh, that's why I'm for micro conversations rather than trying to come up. With, you can start with a small number, and you can get by quite effectively for what purposes we are using chatbots for or agents is to. You know, is it just to provide a service? Is it to answer a few queries? Or in our case, is it to get you to reflect and think or to help you do sense making? So I think it really depends on the task and the context. But I would, I would you know, we've, we've been sort of always thinking top down natural language processing, let's have this massive, you know, set, you know, in your case, thousands. But I think actually, why not start from the bottom and build up and have just a small set and see what works for very constrained settings? So. Yes, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting uh, uh, proposal. Yeah, so, so my, my worry would be that when you, uh, uh, you need, you, you will not know what kind of conversations can be conducted if you don't enable it in these patterns, so to say. Uh, if the human says something that falls with, uh, outside of your framework, uh, then you, you, will not, you will not know what kind of patterns would have been needed to accommodate this. That's true, and that's one of the downsides of it, having a constrained approach. But you could get overcomplicated, and you could select the wrong pattern, which could, be, sure. yeah. could be equally frustrating because it's like, no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, whereas, yeah, it's. Uh, I think there's somewhere you know trying to come together, but anyway. uh -huh. I would say though that uh, we humans we also uh, apply the wrong patterns all the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> but with that note, uh, I want to go to a question that or a point that Wendy McKay uh, posted. I, I think this is during Jennifer's talk as somewhat related to this. And I'm not sure if uh, Wendy, um, if we, uh, we can open your mic if you're there still, but I can try to rephrase what you were saying. And this is also related to, uh, I think, a valuable point from Yvonne's uh, talk where we um, looked at the, um, how, how do we communicate what are the capabilities of, of the agent? How, how we do a chatbot that is taking into the task and context specific constraints and capabilities into account. And when he was posting this comment that, uh, that the style of the system's response directly affects the user's expectations of what the system can understand 
and then she um, said that this is the principle of habitable sublanguage. I don't know about that, but that sounds like related to what Wendy has been talking about earlier, which is this co-adaptation. So we sort of adapt our linguistic uh, practices into the capabilities that we perceive and expect in the, in the, in the partner. So she's continuing that. So if the system talks in a very chatty style, the user is more likely to respond that way with higher expectations of the system. So maybe I'll, I'll post this to, to Jennifer, if you have a remark, a uh, response to this. No, I, I completely agree with that, actually, because we are building expectations um, in what the systems are capable just by knowing that the system is an agent or a robot. And we are, in any case, already kind of learning protocols to talk with social robots. I mean, who in here hasn't had to, like, learn which keywords to actually give to a pepper so that pepper can answer? And we're also learning that we need to wait for pepper to make this beep when it's ready to listen to us or when it has listened to the question. So we are learning this behavior and this protocol already. And I completely agree with, with, with Wendy's comment that the way the agent interact with us shape our side of the interaction as well. And it's also actually funny to see how people treat the, the, the social and psychological impact of or aspect of social robotics to see how people actually talk to a robot. And I was reading a paper recently in which they were talking about the very first um, type of social robot that they had in the lab and the way people interacted with the robot saying oh because the robot was buggy and there was I mean first social robots and basically researchers saying something along the line of oh but give him a little bit of time it's just his first work first day of work or immediately like ah so useless and you would imagine that if you would replace the, the robot by a human this is insanely condescending no one would actually talk to a human the way most of us talk to a robot and so that's also one of the point of my of my, my my point and my claim and why I think that unless we have indistinguishable humans in front of us, there will be, I agree with Wendy, there will be this expectation and maybe we can just use it instead of just pretending they don't exist. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Mohamed, you have your... Yes, uh, thanks for this, uh, this comments. I mean, it, it reminds me... Uh, uh, works that we have been doing in uh, infant directed speech and when you look to that and, uh, and robot directed speech and even pet directed speech they look very similar in some way and, and there have been a lot of discussion about uh, why we speak in this way to infants because you exaggerate and, and you not really speak like that I mean uh, uh, it, if it has a negative impact or not but indeed it's it, it, it uh, and for for our workshop I think it's interesting is that the works we have been reviewing papers on, on that and uh, what is interesting is that you do two things with that one uh, is that you uh, basically communicate and you say okay this message is for you uh, as uh, you have a kind of communication and by the exaggeration so you try to engage and of course you have also the content and, and in this case uh, and uh, also for for the robotic side it's uh, probably difficult to separate the two stuff uh, and it's in this way that we we do that and even if you take the the robot uh, if it's, uh, it is a paper or if it is an arm robotics arm maybe you will not speak to the same way and this is true for for your car and you true for several things like that but the alignment is interesting and i think i agree i fully agree that uh, trying to take that into account and uh, take benefit of it it's quite interesting and there are some some uh, so some approaches uh, that uh, we have been also investigating is that you take uh, benefit of the fact that this is another interaction, but there would be an expectation about the alignment, and you you take that into account to improve your interaction. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Delphine, you were the next. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add that sometimes uh, the expectations can be in favor of the virtual agent. Uh, we've been running a, another one experiment where we replaced the uh, virtual counselor by a human counselor. Uh, she was an actor and she uh, uh, exhibited exactly the same uh, behaviors as the virtual agents. And we tested the two conditions, the neutral one and the intimacy one. And that was really interesting to see that the uh, neutral one was much less good uh, in the human condition than in the virtual condition because people were expected to have social behaviors with an agent with a human but not that much with an agent so if the agent is not 
social, it's fine because this is my expectation. But if the human is not, it's really a big problem. So sometimes having virtual agent, people can be more, like they can understand more if uh, the agent is, uh, mis is like doesn't understand or make uh, some uh, errors. So yeah, I think it depends on the context. And uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes expectation can be uh, in favor of the, the agent. Uh, thank you, and uh, Yasmin. Uh, yes, thank you. So this is more like a question to everybody, not because uh, not like a comment, because it's not my real uh, uh, field, so to say, or, or my expert field. And uh, this is, is it actually used that when, I mean, do companies, but maybe also researchers use it to produce a robot uh, that looks in a certain way? So um, so people would communicate with it in a certain way that would be good for the robot. Like for example, uh, as Mohammed said, if it's if it's a small child, of course you speak differently to to it. Maybe you speak simpler, and you you speak um, yeah more 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 yeah in, in simpler terms just. And maybe if you have a robot that is designed like this, uh, looks like a child, then then maybe people also would would approach it more like a child, and and that is good because the robot uh, yeah. It's not so good with natural language processing or other other characteristics that you could uh, put in the visual uh, uh, appearance of the robot, but maybe also in the behavior it, so that people would communicate with the robot in a certain way. I don't know, maybe somebody has a comment on that. Uh, Mohammed, do you want to? Uh, yeah, um, it's, it's several years ago, what we did is. Uh, uh, and we, we have several examples of that. Is uh, what is interesting is when you put two kind of robots, okay, at the same time. Well, let's say you put an arm and an now, or you put uh, uh, a humanoid, very complex with a lot of stuff, and you put a Cosmo, very small robot. Here you see clearly the, this kind of uh, changing the prosody, for example, and and even the vocabulary and the the linguistic part, because there are clearly expectation. And this is true. Also, we made an experiment where you have virtual agents, like uh, looks like humans, and we did that with Ibo several years ago. And Ibo, they were not expecting uh, that's the um, in the storytelling, for example, experiments. So it's just you you as a human, you uh, you say here uh, you you to to both of them. It's interesting is, is that the software behind them is exactly the same. There is nothing about uh, the embodiment. But people were not expecting that the uh, Ibo was understanding the questions, uh, the, 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 the story, but they were expecting that the uh, virtual agent was understanding that. So you see that. I mean, it's, uh, but I, I think uh, what you said about industry, I don't know if they have this kind of stuff, but I, I think, yes, I should say, uh, I may say that, uh, yes, people are taking that into account in the design of, uh, of uh, the robot. Thank you, Mohamed. Uh, Yvonne, you, you were your next. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of research in this area, but I'm interested in whether in, you know, having a textual conversation with a chatbot rather than a robot, which is a physical thing, um, and the, whether adding a, uh, a virtual agent that nods its head and you know, blinks its eyes makes a difference. And I, I don't think it does. I think you can have just as uh, rich uh, conversation with an agent like Replica without her sort of in the background going like this. So I think actually, you know, we know it's a chat bot uh, because it's, the, it's got the little uh, um, emoji. And you know it's got limited, and let's sort of design to match those expectations rather than trying to embellish the chatbot to appear as if it's you know got some human qualities to it. So I'm I'm actually not in favour of having these kind of embellishments, but probably I you know Delphine will have a, a, a re reply to that. Thank you, and I, I actually tend to agree with you, but then uh, let's talk about that later. Uh, Florian, are you with the next? As a follow up to what uh, Yvonne said, that in chatbots, they tend to also give titles like this is an uh, apprentice uh, chatbot that kind of gives uh, expectations as well. But my question would actually be to what the uh, how big the effect is of such uh, uh, a name or appearance. So when the conversation starts, 
people kind of accommodate to what they think of uh, the capacities of the chatbot. So uh, is there some duration at which this effect is largest and, and how fast does it wear off? That, that's what I would ask. Thank you for, and uh, Delphine, do you want to respond back to Yvonne? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, actually, um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have the same opinion. I think that um, it, like um, the nonverbal behaviors are not there to embellish the, uh, the chat, but I think it's just a question of concept, of context. I mean, in some contexts, for example, in human-human interaction, it's okay to text. We don't need to see the person, but in other contexts, it's really um, necessary to see the person to catch the um, specific emotion, uh, something that when you only have the text, it, it's um, diminished. I mean, you don't have all the information that is needed to understand the, the specificities of the, of the communication. And I think for a virtual agent, it's exactly the same. Um, the, the additional uh, features, uh, the smiling, the uh, gestures have a role in the communication are necessary uh, to uh, convey emotions, social at attitudes, but they are not always necessary. And that's the reason why uh, we don't always need to have uh, embodied agent. Sometimes just like textual agent is okay. But it, it, has, it has to answer a role. And I think it's really to, um, to make the communication with the virtual agent easier for the humans. It's not just like to make a new humans or augmented humans. It's just to facilitate the communication. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. You've been having your hand up for a while, so please. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted, I mean, Delphine already kind of made the point I wanted to make as well, but I also wanted to say that as for everything else, it depends on the application and what you want to do with the agent, right? Because yes, of course, and I think Yvonne, it's you who put in the chat, do we really want to have an agent that can influence his emotion as Delphine was explaining that intimacy has a direct link with the emotions? And do we really want to have this kind of agent if we have a selling uh, if we're trying to sell an apartment. And I agree with you, but at the same time, I'm also working on a micro project and having a collaboration with um, Ana Paiva in Portugal, who is working a lot on prosociality. And there, it might become much more interesting to actually have an agent that can influence us and display this kind of intimacy and display this kind of human like, because you want to influence the user or the human to be more prosocial, to do something good. So. It always depends on the context, and I think I think I agree. In some cases, we absolutely don't need the embodiment, and it actually is actually shown that whether it's virtual or robot, the embodiment has a huge impact on the interaction, uh, and sometimes it's not necessary. But as for everything else, depending on what you want to do, that could actually be a plus. I think the um, just to reply, it's quite dangerous of us to be designing these if you think it has that effect, because if they get, you know, if we design uh, these agents to manipulate our emotions, whether we're buying, whether, you know, it's uh, in a uh, educational setting, we are manipulating the child. There's all sorts of implications if we find that this is, you know, it might be that there's a nice context where, you know, having the agent might be pro-social and that encourages the user to be pro-social, but there, there are many others where it might manipulate you. And so we have to be mindful if we're going to develop these types of agents that have uh, this power over us. That's over to you, Delphine. Thank you. Yeah, just, uh, just to add something um, about what you just said, uh, Jennifer, I think that like um, uh, social uh, skills can be also conveyed through the verbal. So um, like the social dimensions is not only um, um, related to, uh, to um, the embodiment. So we can also convey emotion and uh, social abilities through the, uh, through the verbal. So it can be working, for example, replica, is a great uh, example of it. And um, uh, just to, to, uh, to go uh, further to what you said, uh, even uh, in education is really interesting to see how having, for example, an empathetic uh, agent, tutor agent can help uh, tutees to uh, better understand, to uh, be more motivated, uh, to be less shy, to make less errors. So I think it's really, yeah, you, you 
definitely said it. Uh, it's it, it's uh, um, the context is really important and the rules uh, for the conceptor of chatbots, but also just uh, the states must uh, really make rules um, and ethical rules about what we can do and what we cannot do with a with our chatbots, but I think it's exactly the same problem with human, actually. I mean, the manipulation is not only uh, uh, served to uh, to chatbots. Yasmin, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, well, actually, it's. Uh, I think it's maybe more related to what Yvonne says. Uh, what I wanted to say is uh, that uh, this reminded me of uh, persuasive computing. So there is an own field that has to do with influencing human behavior by computing. And obviously, human uh, computer interaction and communication has to do with this field because by communicating, you can influence the human. And uh, as um, I think Dirkin also said, yes, there are, it's a very uh, difficult ethical questions that are um, combined uh, with this uh, field. Even if you want to do good, maybe from the beginning, then in the end, uh, you know, maybe if you want, uh, like for example, uh, from from own experience, I can I can say. Uh, that if you want to have a persuasive uh, computing system that should bring the human maybe to uh, a more climate-friendly and uh, sustainable lifestyle, uh, that's a very good thing. So you want you would like to say, yeah, uh, we encourage this system. That's very good. But in the end, uh, it always can go wrong. And uh, and that I wanted also to. For this, I wanted also to, to mention um, Stuart Russell's book from 2019 of Human Compatible, uh, where he makes the point that it's uh, it's really hard to put uh, what we want, our objectives, into the system. There can always be go things going wrong. Also, Nick Bostrom wrote this book on superintelligence, where um, where you, for example, where you want to say, if you want to give, it's just an example, give the goal, uh, we want every human to be happy. Then maybe the AI would go ahead and uh, and, and put a, a, something into your brain that just makes uh, your hormones uh, emitted to it so, so that makes you feel happy in that way. And that is obviously not what we had in mind, but still the AI could come to that conclusion that that would work the most efficient way. So yeah, communicating um, agents, influencing the behavior of the human, definitely very uh, hard uh, ethical questions combined with that. That was just my comment. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't see any hands up, but I'm gonna br bring up one question from the chat that was uh, meant for Delphine. And uh, there's, there's a question from Lionel uh, that, um, that I think is really, really, really up given the discussions that we've been having this far, because that there's, you know, in, in a rough sense, there's like two camps here. One, one of them is saying that, okay, we should not communicate, uh, you know, more than uh, what the AI is capable of doing. And, and there's the other extreme that, okay, we, should, we, we can try to be like human, human like as, as, as we want. And of course, in real applications, you need to select the operating point depending on, on, you know, what you want to do and what you can do. Uh, but then there's a question that, about uncanny valley and, and strangeness in, in conversation with virtual agents. And, and this is a classic topic that cuts across, you know, HCI and, and graphics. And now we're talking about agents with whom you can actually interact. And unlike in those old studies, that it's basically showing animations of, of agents. And I, I wonder, what's the situation now with the uncanny valley? Yeah, thank you. I think that, like, uncanny valley is a major question. And... Uh, uh, since we're working on the human agent interaction, and especially uh, in uh, embodiment, uh, we have to get this uh, question in mind. Um, I, th I mean, what we know uh, about Uncanny Valley is that it's mainly about the uh, congruency which, between all the aspects of the, the person or the, the virtual character. So we definitely have to work on this congruency. So the behavioral congruency, uh, um, the rendering, and now we understand that the emotional and social congruency is needed too. So this is uh, one um, one point to 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 say again that 
uh, social and emotional aspects are important when we are interacting with another one. And this other one couldn't be a uh, virtual. Um, and to to answer about what uh, I just presented before, I damn I know that our agents are still uh, eliciting uh, uncanny valley uh, We are way far to uh, erase this. I know it, but we are working hard on it. <laughs> Thank you, Delphi. And I think we're approaching the ending of this panel, and we decided that we don't want to spend you know long hours in a, in a workshop. Although you know this sounds very interesting discussion. And I'd like to, uh, because there were no final questions from the audience, I'd like to maybe do a quick round of the panelists and like what sort of a main takeaway for, for you uh, out of this discussion. I don't know if Delphi, if you can start. Are you muted? I, I didn't hear the question, sorry. Uh, so so what, what do you think was a main takeaway for you from all this discussion that we had? Well, um, I don't know if I can resume it in one sentence, but uh, I think that, uh, we really have to go um, further in uh, understanding the human human communication and what parts of human human communication can be integrated in uh, research in uh, in uh, AI and human computer interaction. And maybe not everything in the human communication is, is interesting and must to be um, uh, put in the human AI communication. So we have to yeah, make choices and a better understand what is important and what is not. Thank, thank you for the summary. And uh, let, let's uh, move on. Uh, Florian, do you have some final words you want to? Um, yeah, my main takeaway is that it's really interesting to see all the different uh, talks. And what we also uh, uh, mentioned a lot of times is that a lot of questions are very application oriented and contextualized and and uh, in the, the context of this workshop is already multidisciplinarity so uh, my main takeaway is that that we really need to try to bridge a lot of these islands so this, so as different applications what do we need there but definitely also what are the things that we can take uh, and, and generalize and, and, and reuse in other applications. And, and I think that's a big challenge in the coming years. Very, very apt point. Uh, Yvonne, do you have some words? Yeah, my main takeaway is that I was really uh, pleased to hear the some of the talks that were saying similar things to me about how do we think about designing uh, the conversations based on research in the social sciences and, and HCI and take from there as well as uh, AI. And I think that's really important. But it's also interesting to see, I mean, I was partly being uh, provocative because that's what panel is, that we have two camps, that we have those that think that we should be designing them to be more human-like with emotions in order to emulate human behavior to trigger certain types of behaviors, whether it's learning or, or whatever. And then there's the other camp, which is, you now let's design them to be utilitarian functional, the chatbots and the agents to serve a purpose, which is to help users get on with their tasks. And it's not about you know, having a, a rich conversation with something that's trying to be a human. So those are two takeaways for me. Thank you. Thanks. That's a good summary. Uh, Yasmin. Yes, um, so I would say uh, uh, that uh, communication is a real rich topic, that's what I would, would, would say, and that has many different angles and perspectives and way to approach the question, and that it can be very powerful and therefore should be handled with care. Yes. We're playing with fire here, thanks. Okay, and uh, Jennifer, you, you started the whole workshop, this was your idea, so I, I think the, the last words belong to you. Thanks. <laughs> no, it was really, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to see all, to have seen all your presentations and the discussions that was really insightful and extremely interesting. And I would say that my main takeaway is that we need to talk more because this multidisciplinary workshop and the discussions we've had has shown it that I think, I believe this communication with in human AI interaction has a huge potential for task-oriented communication, for a lot of various applications, but for this, we really need to be more interdisciplinary ourselves. And I know that we, by we, I say AI researchers, which I belong, the group I belong to, we tend to take what makes it 
you know, make our model possible from other fields, but either, you know, restrict it too much or have it too ill-defined. And we must stop doing that. <laughs> and we need, we need more interdisciplinary project and we need more broad and broader conversation on this topic itself. That would be Thank you, that's, a, that's a very good uh, bridge then to Mohamed, if you have any, let's say, organizational final words. No, no, it's, uh, it's uh, great what you said, in fact, it's exactly a, a bit of the direction. Just I wanted to thank uh, all of you, I mean, for, for that, that was really good. I mean, uh, that's really interesting. And I think we are in the, the good net. Uh, it's really uh, interesting to see that we have the potential to, to propose uh, new actions and we have the place for doing that. I mean, uh, there is uh, only the question of how we do that, but we have the place on that. So I would just say maybe for the audience and all the people that uh, there will be uh, for, for sure uh, actions to do, and we should communicate about them uh, uh, very soon uh, in a way or another. Uh, but uh, please don't hesitate, I mean, to, to reach us uh, for, for that. Uh, uh, and if you have ideas, uh, propositions on the stuff, we are also here to organize that for, for you, I mean, for the community. Mm. Thanks to, to all of of you and thanks Santi. Mm. Big thanks to panelists and big thanks to the audience uh, for keeping, keeping the discussions live. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you very much.